Stephen Hunter took dead aim at two professional goals, to be a film critic for a major newspaper and to be a novelist. In 1982, after 11 years at the Baltimore Sun, he was named chief film critic for the publication. By that time, Hunter had published his first novel, The Master Sniper, and would publish his second later that same year. But it wasn't until 1993 that Hunter would create the character that would define his career and put him permanently on bestseller list, Bob Lee Swagger. The novel Point of Impact introduced Swagger, a reclusive and often inscrutable sniper of preternatural skill, pulled reluctantly back into society for one more mission. The novel launched both a film and television adaptation and also announced the dawn of a new thriller subgenre, the sniper novel. Hunter expanded the Swagger universe to include books about his father, Marine and Congressional Medal of Honor winner turned lawman, Earl Swagger. Three Earl Swagger books, Havana, Pale Horse Coming, and Hot Springs landed on the New York Times bestseller list. In his parallel life as a movie critic, Mr. Hunter moved from the Sun to the Washington Post in 1997, where he became, along with Roger Ebert, one of only two film critics to win the Pulitzer Prize. Now retired from the Post, you can usually find Mr. Hunter at his typewriter, cranking out the next bestseller, or just as likely, throwing lead down the gun range with any number of the firearms in his extensive collection. In all of his pursuits, Stephen Hunter remains solidly on target. Well, I'll tell you what, Eric, what, uh, why don't you go ahead and start us off with the questions? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll dive in. Um, so, Steve, Bob Lee Swagger is one of the most iconic and beloved snipers in American fiction. Um, so can you kind of tell us um, how you crafted him, how you designed um, his uh, as a person and as a character and how he came to life? Well, he was inspired initially by uh, the book Marine Sniper. And I wish I could remember the author's name because I like to give other guys plugs. Uh, <laughs> and that was Bob Lee. That was, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, that was, um, uh, you know, the, the famous Marine sniper. From Carlos. Carlos Hathcock. Carlos Hathcock, yes, indeed. And uh, so I sort of modeled him on Carlos Hathcock, which is how I ended up in Arkansas, a state I'd never visited. And if you'd have told me then that I'd end up the, uh, the homer of West, West Arkansas alpha male culture, <laughs> I would have... I wouldn't know what you were talking about. Uh, but I wrote that book, and at one point it sucked. Uh, and one of the problems, there were many problems with it, but one of the problems was that he was a tracing of Carlos Hathcock and not an independent character. So mm -hmm. on a subsequent draft, I just sat down and tried to forget Carlos Hathcock and make him... I guess, because he came from my self-conscious, a projection of me if I had courage, stamina, talent, and uh, been a Marine. <laughs> Just those things. And so I sort of filled the outline with my own neurotics, uh, neuroticism as filtered through a variety of disguises. And that's when he came alive. Uh, and he sort of continued... He exists in this sort of netherworld in which he is probably more self-aware than many snipers would be, although that might not be the with the case with the fellow we all call Jack Carr, who's very bright. But he was he and because of what he'd gone through, he'd set about to educate himself primarily on war because he wanted to know what happened. And somehow in all the reading he did and in all the exploring he did and all the thought he put into it, he became uh, a different kind of man, much more reflective and probably smarter. And he learned that he had, and he's ultimately become a bobbly swagger rifle detective. He <laughs> understands <laughs> what happens in a shooting because he's been in so many shooting incidents and he can look at the clues and put together can reconstruct he's like a uh, oh he's like one of those uh, anthropologists or archaeologists who can draw faces from skulls but what he does <laughs> is he can put the flesh on the skeleton of gunfight data and that gives him 
uh, kind of an edge up on anybody he's working with. And that's sort of the course that the, the books have, fall, have, uh, have uh, followed. Occasionally I get, <laughs> I mean, this is very funny. I get, I see Amazon's uh, reviews on Amazon that don't like a particular book and they say, what happened to Stephen Hunter? Why did you kill him and replace him with a hat? That's the Bob Lee swagger I know. And people, they think they own him and it annoys them when I uh, use, you know, authorial rights to invent something or do something that they don't agree with. So that's, that's how that. Well, there's a lot of experts out there. there we well, go. The other thing is, you, you know, you've made a, uh, a character who's, who's, who's like flesh and blood. And so these people have like an attachment to it as if they were part of, as if he was part of the family and how dare you mess with him, even though you, you created the damn character. <laughs> um, so, but Stephen, you, you, you've gifted us with um, 11, 11 Bobby Lee Swagger novels and three about his father, Earl. Um, and the further down the road you go with these characters, are you finding it more difficult or easier to plot the stories? Uh, well, I think I have the voice down. Uh, I've, I've tried to make him, I've, I've tried to chronicle his, his, not only his physical aging, but his mental aging. And as I said before, he's more reflective now. I think he's more perceptive. He's not the sort of uh, hard, practical, focused, disinterested combat guy he was for many, you know, during his active service career. Mm -hmm. And it was that personality that enabled him to survive Vietnam. He hasn't abandoned that personality, but he is also capable now. He's worked very hard to speak grammatically. He's, he's a family man. I mean, the chronicle of the books is that he rejoined society. If you look at the books as a whole, uh, what you're seeing is first his, he's trying to reclaim I think his natural right as a as a heroic individual, his natural place in the firmament, and that's been stolen from him. And the first book is about how he gets that back, and all subsequent books are about him getting other people's, uh, other snipers or other warriors' uh, identities back and getting them the recognition and the respect uh, that they, uh, that they, that they deserve and has been stolen by them. And of course the eternal enemy in my books is they, they being the brass, they being the Pentagon, they being the politicians, they being the journalists, all the people who weren't there and didn't do that, uh, but somehow feel, uh, some, uh, more moral superiority and, and, and feel that they can use the gunfighters and the shooters to their own, to their own agenda advantage. And yeah. they find out usually that they're wrong. And that's what Bob Lee Swagger, that's what he does professionally. Right. So, you know, crafting a character like that, I, I think it was Brad Taylor one time that I heard what he said, you know, you start writing a novel and it's a blank slate. You know, you have a whole universe available to you. And as soon as you put word to paper, you start making that universe smaller and smaller. And every decision you make limits that character or does that. So did you find with um, decisions you made with Bob Lee, have you had any that you did early in the series that you've thought now, man, I, I, I closed myself off on the directions I could have <laughs> gone or things I could have done with him? Uh, actually, it was, I, I mean, I think that what he said is very true. My version of that is a novel is a piece of marble. It's a cube of mar marble and you're a sculptor and you have grand plans. But the first time you take that chisel and that hammer <laughs> and you knock a piece off, you get a new face and the new face changes everything. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's suddenly, like you know, no, no, no marble survives contact with the, with the, <laughs> uh, with the chisel and no plan survives contact with the enemy. Everything you do changes everything that follows. That being said, I have found that I'm much more comfortable in a smaller universe than in a larger universe. And the idea of, having a whole universe to fill 
uh, having a complete blank slate and being free to write anything from Dune to the sun also rises to the Odyssey. I mean, I don't have the talent for any of those, but I do, uh, I, I'm not comfortable with all those possibilities. And I'm much, you know, I'm much more comfortable deciding whether or not Bob should be using a 6.5 Krieg or sticking with the old 308 Winchester. That's the kind of decision that is fun for me to make, but I could never, uh, you know, I like his tight little world. I like tracking them over time. I like seeing the characters 10 years later. I like, as I say, watching them go, tracking their careers. Just that stuff has proven completely fascinating to me mm. in ways I never could have anticipated. Yeah. Well, Stephen, um, since uh, Eric had to leave early, we, we put out a thing to our viewers and we, uh, one of our viewers won a contest to become our, uh, our co-host. Um, Take my place. <laughs> he's coming on here in just a second. He's a, a young gentleman. I'm like trying to connect like I was. <laughs> no, a young gentleman from Utah. He might, you might recognize him. Uh, hey, Stephen, it's Jack Carr here. <laughs> oh, be damn! There he is. I'm very back. How's it going? That's going fine. These these younger guys are keeping me jumping and hopefully <laughs> boosting I know it. a little. They keep you on your toes. That's for sure. Oh, well, that's for sure. Well, <laughs> Stephen, I'm, I'm sorry I have to take off and, and miss this thing because this is going to turn into quite the party. But it was an honor <laughs> to speak with you, Jack. Thank you so much for stepping in. You surely oh. are bigger shoes than me, but um, thank you for doing it. I, if I didn't have a family event, I was going to toast both of you with someone told me to get this recently, but I'll save it for another time. So, <laughs> Rye. Hard to beat that rendezvous rye from High West. I got a, a couple <laughs> bottles right behind me there. Just a couple. <laughs> well, Jack, since you're on, we're going we're gonna to give you the next question, buddy. There you go. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I was just running around like a madman um, because it, today was, it was, it was you know, all the days are chaos around here. But there's something I, one of those things I put in a very special place, so special that I cannot find it right now. <laughs> uh, it's safe. It, uh, uh, it's 10 it, times a day. <laughs> I, believe me, I get it. I'd, uh, so what it was, was uh, right after September 11th, we uh, got activated to go to the Middle East. We thought we were going into Afghanistan. We ended up going to do the shipboarding operations out of Kuwait for the uh, ships leaving Iraq and uh, with to enforce the oil embargo but uh what i did before we left is i ran down to a local print shop because we were in guam at the time when september 11th happened and i had them print out cards and the cards said we deal in lead friend delta platoon scout snipers and then our symbol for our platoon which was a knight and i had those printed up and gave them to our snipers uh to leave as calling cards and uh, of course i got that from point of impact by nice the master Steve yeah Brown. so uh yeah so i'll be sending you one of those as soon as i track them down they're they're really these gun tapes i'm sure i would love to have one believe me absolutely absolutely it, it's funny right before you came on uh steven was giving an answer and he, and he referenced you so i was it was hard for me not to laugh when he i know we were trying to hold our breath your right? name. Was, <laughs> you came oh, up yeah. in the interview yeah well, another thing on my list is uh is the the 38 super and i i read this so early i didn't know what a 38 super was back when i when i first read uh started reading these novels uh so one of those is is on my short list in the years to come it has to be the right one though and it's gonna You'll be enjoy great. shooting it a lot they're great fun to shoot yeah yeah if i know i i learned them through you and uh i want to get one of the just the right time period and fits with the books and, and all the rest of it so that's uh that's on my short list Nice. Thank, you for thank you for your inspiration. So really, instead of a question, uh, I just wanted to thank you. For, hey, that, uh, all yeah. Dude, listen, we got Stephen Hunter and Jack Carr on the show. I mean, <laughs> now, Stephen, are you aware of uh, Jack's uh, camp uh, making a pretty good size announcement today on, in, uh, on social media regarding uh, something with his first book? Uh, yes, I am. I actually saw it and was going to send him uh, a uh, needling email. But... <laughs> you still can. <laughs> Just, you, know, you can't needle a seal sniper. What <laughs> point is there? Um, so I was, uh, I'm very pleased. Jack's success is, 
is excellent and phenomenal, and I hope he enjoys every uh, moment of it. It's a hard game, okay? Uh, it's, it's a treacherous world. It's tricky. The market changes in a blink of an eye. Everybody thinks they know what's right, and none of them know what's right. And uh, I just, uh, you know, he's negotiated it so far brilliantly, and uh, my hat's off to him, for he understands how it works. And he's he, obviously, uh, he's a very, very quick study. In fact, I sort of look on him as my mentor. What could I say? <laughs> you know, I'm 58 years older or something. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I'm just stumbling along trying to do the best I can and look at all these things is uh, kind of like I would look at the battle space, just look for emerging opportunities, uh, just like I would out there. And in this case, the, uh, uh, the repercussions of doing something wrong or making a mistake are a lot less dire. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so I can take a little more time with it, which is, uh, which is nice, but I kind of look at it the same way, just look for those emerging opportunities. And, uh, Stumbling on is a very good description of a writer's life, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I, I am enjoying every minute, that's for sure. Now, you, is, uh, is it true that you two were at SHOT Show uh, trading pictures just recently? Yes, it is. It's entirely accidental. I was uh, wandering the floor with a friend, actually, Mark Keefe, who's the editor of American Rifleman. We were looking for the Sig Sauer booth, and I saw this huge line. And before I, before I, I said, oh, only one person gets lines like that. Well, two people, Charlize <laughs> Theron and Jack Pop. <laughs> I didn't think Charlize was going to be a shot. I don't know. I just didn't see why. She's a fan of his book. Yeah, yeah, I hope. <laughs> so we, uh, we were walking, I, and then I saw them clutching uh, his books, and I knew he was there. And it was such a delight, such an unexpected delight. And uh, we had a good few minutes, a very nice visit. Yeah, no, it, was, uh, it was on my highlight of SHOT Show, with that, hands down. Uh, I was so surprised. That was amazing. It was such, a, such an honor for you to drop by, just beyond cool. And, then, and you were there for an award, is that right? Was there uh, there's some sort of an award that night? Yes, I got the, uh, I know you'll get it soon, Jack, but I got the uh, media, let's see, what is it? Professional Outdoor Media Association Firearms Communicator of the Year Award. Oh, uh, that's, that's nice. Cool. And it's Fantastic. a very nice plaque. It goes up on the wall with my other plaque. And it's, uh, it was, um, you know, it was, it, I just, it's a little tiny twitch of res recognition that it, that it represents is uh, surprisingly meaningful to me. I was very touched because, and I'm sure this is true of, Jack as well. One of the things I have tried to do as a writer, particularly dealing with firearms, is to get the stuff right. Because so much that is written is crap. Yeah. And I just, uh, I thought to myself, if I can get it right, I'm going to have a little something here that nobody else has yet got. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be recognized for that. Uh, oh yeah, well, it's, it's noticeable. Even back when I really didn't uh, didn't know what I was doing, I, mean, I was still a student of the gun. Even back then, before I uh, joined the Navy, and it was uh, very uh, very evident that, that you had done your research and you knew what you're talking about. You were doing it from uh, a different. You're taking a different tact than other authors in the space. And uh, I mean, there, there, there's no writing like yours out there. That is for sure. That there's that kind of going back to that time. Um, Point of Impact was my baptism, Stephen, um, in your work. And uh, I remember when I discovered it, as I'm inclined to do when I like an author, I started to search out every scrap of writing and every bit of information I could find about you. And I was stunned that you were the same Stephen Hunter that was the movie critic. And for some reason, those two <laughs> things seem incongruous to me. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about the dichotomy, if there is one, about having one foot on the creative field and one foot in the proverbial cheap seats? Uh, I always, I, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to be the movie critic of a very good uh, daily newspaper, and I wanted to write what used to be called hard mail novels. That sounds sort of, you know, gay, but I, it's <laughs> books about shooters and door kickers and uh, spies and tough cops and things like that. And uh, I, I, 
I was just fortunate in the way it broke in terms of career in that I had become uh, being, I, I also understood given the mechanics uh, and the culture of a newspaper, that one of the ways to rise on the newspaper was to validate yourself in another field. And so when I published a book, my first book, The Master Sniper in 1980, I was the only guy on the Baltimore Sun who'd published a novel since, I don't know, 20, 25 years. And that, that validated me and it made me suddenly from nowhere, it made me a player. And so I became the film critic eventually. Uh, I think publishing that and another novel were, were part, of the, part of the process. Uh, but I found that I couldn't give up either of them. It, it, you know, I like, I mean, they both, they offered different pleasures of what I could do, which was right a little. And the newspaper work gave me the thrill of writing hot and fast and publishing it the next day, getting reaction and feedback and hate mail and all of that <laughs> stuff that newspaper get regularly. Whereas <laughs> the novel gave me the pleasure of hunkering down, trying to get it right and being in no rush to finish, having uh, subjecting yourself to the daily discipline. And it turned out that the, the different rhythms of those two things, instead of destroying each other, complemented each other. And so I was able to, for a long, long time, I was writing literally hundreds. I Several times I led both the Sun and the Post in bylines, but I wrote a lot. I was one of the heavy producers for the newspaper, but I was also able to go home and work hard for an hour or two on the books. And that rhythm was very pleasant to me. Of course, it utterly destroyed every other aspect of my life. But I was so... <laughs> I was so happy about what I had, what I was doing that I didn't really mind the disintegration of my marriage and the loss of my children. No, no, I mean, I, I didn't, I exaggerate. But the, the, one of the things, I, I only say that because one of the things I always encounter, and I'm sure Jack does too, at, when I attend writing conferences, is I always attend the guy who says to me, Oh, I think I could write a publishable novel, but my wife Mary, she just has this honeydew list, and I've got to do that every weekend, and somehow that tires me out so much. I just have don't have any energy left to write, and I think to myself, you know, I'm always polite and friendly, but I realize I am talking to one of the Walking Dead. He is <laughs> dead. He will never publish. You have to have. You have to have some kind of willingness to <clears throat> focus. And when you do that, it costs you in other areas. Yes. And if you're not okay with that, if you can't live with that, if you're too weak to fight for that, you're never going to make it in, in, in this particular screwball world. Because the entry fee, again, I know Jack will agree, the the entry fee to getting into it is you've got to do the work. Yeah. If you can't find the time to do the work, if you can't make the time to do the work, you're going to end up the bitterest loser on the copy desk at, that they've been trying <laughs> to get rid of for five years. But he's, even though he's, you know, that you just, you will not be a happy camper. Yeah. So. Well, my, my wife's name is Mary and part of her honey-do list is get my ass at the computer and write the book so <laughs> okay there you go so she, she knows what she's talking about yeah he does. married the right girl that's for yeah, sure yeah he did <laughs> hey so steven you've you've lived through many iterations and generations of the thriller market from you know from the early earliest part i mean you helped kind of define it with your sniper rifles uh books what do you see the trend in the thriller market, say in the next decade, where do you where do you see us going moving forward? Jack Carr, what else do you need to know? That's why we brought him on. I thought so. <laughs> no, um, you know what? I'm actually going to beg that question off because I'm proud of the fact that my books, not entirely but largely, are not market driven. Uh, I've made some concessions to this this 
monster bitch we call the market. Mm. Uh, but I've always, you know, I write the books. I'm proud to say if I've achieved anything, it's that I've written the books that I wanted to write. Uh, I, 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 you know, and I seem to alternate between I'll write it, what I call a deeper book, which usually is set in history. It involves a great deal of research. And then I'll write a faster book, uh, which is extreme, you know, powerful driven narrative uh, that uh, just goes like a bat out of hell. I would, I would suggest that uh, my highest accomplishment in that realm would be um, uh, Dirty White Boys. And I, I uh, you, you know, and I've just, those are my goals to write that kind of book, type of book A or type of work, book B. And I can't really, you know, I mean, I look at the market and I tell you, here's, I, I look at the market and I think a really good best selling book would be about a plucky girl detective and her wise mentor. And they're chasing an assassin hired by the tobacco companies to <laughs> eliminate scientists who are telling the truth about uh, tobacco. Yeah. Now, I think that's a great idea for a commercial novel. And uh, I hope you guys get around to writing it. I couldn't write it <laughs> for all the money oh, in God. the world. You couldn't. There's not enough money to get me to write that novel. <clears throat> I have no idea how to write it. I, I, uh, it's just, it's just alien to me. I would, I have to do what I'm doing because it's. I know that's where my primary strength is, and I know that if I go astray, I'm going to get myself in 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 deep trouble. So right. that's pretty much. You know, my theory of the art is to is to don't worry about the market. Hope that the market comes to you, and if you if it doesn't, you can always publish on, uh, you know, on. I can find a place to publish. You know, doesn't doesn't <laughs> Amazon now yeah. publish? Yeah, much. I can do that. That's all yeah. right. <laughs> well, I, I knew you were chasing the market when you went after that very popular uh, Arkansas samurai uh, contingent of fans. <laughs> yeah. It was clear. Yeah. yeah, that that was a big winner too. By the way, <laughs> I, I love that book. Actually, <laughs> it was right. fun. Well, see that reflected where I was, and I had become obsessed with samurai movies. And uh, particularly a director nobody knows in this country, Hideo Gosha. And he made, he didn't make big samurai movies. He made small, tough, gritty, almost samurai noir. And that's, and, and I really, I wanted to write a movie with a sword fight in it. Uh, I wanted, I, I also seen Kill Bill. And I thought that the sword fight at the end between the two women uh, was was really spectacular. I love sword fights in movies, but I, it was, as we all know, it was kitsch. It was fake. I mean, you knew watching it that it was all pretend. And one of the things I wanted to do with that book was write a book in which two men faced each other on an island and fought to the death, and there was nothing kitsch about it. It was it was realistic. It was for real. You believed in both of them, and that. So, you know, whether I failed or, or succeeded is up to you, but I, <laughs> that, that was the goal of that book. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of, it's, people would, I guess, it obeyed the rules comically enough of not of the American thriller novel, but of the Japanese mid 60s samurai movie. <laughs> oh, it might not have been a very good novel, but it was an excellent mid 60s samurai movie. <laughs> I love that. And that answers the question too. <laughs> so, uh, Jack, you want to yeah. Uh, so, I, I'm, my turn. Yeah, uh, your turn. How far ahead do you think when you're when you're writing? Are you solely focused on the task at hand, or are you dropping little hints for what you might want to explore two books down the line, three books down the line, maybe four books down the line? Uh, mm -hmm. And is that intentional, or do you put a couple of things in there maybe that might pan out later on uh or does it just happen naturally you didn't mean to put something in a book and later you and later you end up exploring it 
four books down the line is uh are those sort of moves intentional and i think you know what i'm getting at with uh uh, the third bullet and with uh, with uh, JFK assassination type things that uh, that uh, might have been hinted at earlier on? Well, uh, it's a complex question, so the uh, answer will be very dry and boring. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of time for you folks to go get another beer. <laughs> the truth is, I this never think about the next book, but when the next book has become the first book, or I'm sorry, when the next book is become the last book, I find that there are still questions that it answers and it propels me into, into a further book. And I frequently, I've actually hired people to go back and read my old books because I can't do it and <laughs> figure stuff out that I can use in the new book. And with, a, a, I mean, sometimes the swagger books ask questions of me, and the only way I can answer them <clears throat> is to write another book. But sometimes I make discoveries uh, after finishing them that stimulate other, uh, other uh, books. For example, uh, the third bullet is in some sense a... Um, a sequel to Point of Impact. Uh, however, when I was writing Point of Impact, it was originally explicitly about the Kennedy assassination. Because at that point in my life, I believed in all the crazy Kennedy theories. I thought there are so many of them, one of them has to be right. <laughs> and I was about halfway through it when I think the guy's name is Alex Posner, published a book on the Kennedy assassination. Uh, again, I don't recall the name of it. It was a very successful and famous book, a very good book, because he's an extremely good researcher. And he pointed out that all the theories are garbage and that the Warren Commission probably had it right. So at that point, I abandoned as the subtext of Point of Impact, the Kennedy assassination. And at one point, I went through it, and I cut out all allusions to the Kennedy assassination. But I'm sloppy, and I missed several. <laughs> and years and years later, I got this idea for the third bullet. And it was it reflected my idea that if there was a conspiracy, it had to be a small conspiracy. It couldn't be a huge conspiracy involving, you know, the Czech intelligence and uh, Sears Roebuck and uh, William, uh, you know, William Holden. It couldn't be those three <laughs> conspirators getting together. It's two or three guys at the most. And I wanted to write that book. And then I realized that, there were clues still in uh, in characters in the third bullet in point of impact that were very useful in structuring, and it just the two of them fit together brilliantly in ways I didn't anticipate. And I must say that was probably the book of mine that was the most fun to write, and uh, it 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 gives me. It, it reinforces my belief that the subconscious is much more important and much smarter than the conscious because subconsciously I had paved the road for the next book, for the follow-up book, but my conscious uh, mind was going, duh, what should I write about next? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just something, there's something in there that's recording and indexing and filing. And when it makes a discovery, it lets you know. Yeah. And uh, so, so I am not consciously thinking of the next book, but there always seems to be stuff in the previous book that, that enables the next book. So mm -hmm. does that answer the question? That certainly does. That certainly does. I, I took a, uh, a page from that, but much more intentionally dropping things here and there in the, the novels thus far that I might be able to explore later on. <laughs> yeah, that, you, I thought you were doing it intentionally. Well, Raymond Chandler said, uh, 
I love my subconscious, but unfortunately, it doesn't work regular hours. So <laughs> that, that gives, sometimes it's there, and sometimes it's uh, thinking about Charlize Theron. I don't it's nothing, nothing wrong with nothing that. Nothing wrong with that. Either. Nothing wrong with that, brother. <laughs> so, uh, so Stephen, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote that I I read uh, in a previous interview you had given. Uh, it says. Show me a pair of ballet slippers, a pencil, a microscope, a dog, or a president, and ask me to write a story, and here's what you'd get. Zilch. Nothing. My brain doesn't work that way. Show me, say, a well-used Colt uh, 1911A1 built in the year 1934, and suddenly I'm excited. So it goes without saying, like, the, the guns and weapons in your novels are almost characters in and of themselves. And I, you've probably been asked this question a thousand times, but I want to hear you answer it. Uh, where did this fascination with firearms come from? Uh, in a sense, it didn't come from anywhere. It was always there. It's very ancient behavior on my part. And I will say that there's nothing phony about it. There's nothing, it's not like I cunningly thought to myself, here's an empty market niche. And I, I just, from an early, early age, in fact, if you went back and looked at my fourth and fifth grade arithmetic books, you'd find the margins festooned mm. with pretty accurate drawings of tops and submachine guns and 357 Smith & Wesson Magnums and Colt 45s. It just, there was something in the firearm that told me immediately <clears throat> that I was home. And I, it's, 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 as I say, it's ancient, ancient, ancient behavior for me. Now, I've done some research into it, and there are many kinds of theories. Uh, the theory that I like the most is I would put myself on... Uh, a, uh, the autism spectrum and mm. the spectrum I the place I would put myself is high functioning high functioning autism I might not even be I might be off the spectrum but just barely off the spectrum and the reason is I found and you will appreciate the scientific rigor of this and accept it right away this comes from something I once saw on the internet that I was never able to find again. Um, and it was 12, uh, 12 symptoms of high functioning autism. And of the 12, I had at least six of them very powerfully, uh, four or five more reasonably powerfully and one, not at all. Uh, and the one that, uh, that I had most powerfully was a fascination to the point of obsession with certain mechanical systems. Mm -hmm. And someone said that uh, uh, an autistic child with that symptom can look at a certain mechanical system, the way a carburetor works, the way a computer works, the way a watch works or a camera works, or the way a revolver works, and they can look at it over and over and over and over again. They never get tired of it. It's always interesting to them. And that seemed to pretty much summarize a lot of my behavior. I just, I can, I can think about these guns all day and all night, and it's just a quality of mind. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with anything else in my in my life there's no explanation in my upbringing uh there's nothing seemingly hereditary about it uh my father hated and feared guns i grew up in an anti-gun family uh, but i just uh, you know at the age of 10 i was a subscriber to uh guns uh to the early guns magazine which i think started in 1956 and i you know, this is one of the reasons why I know and revere all the old gun writers, you know, I, because I was reading them when I was 11 and 12 years old. And so to me, guns are just, just a part of my mind. 
and most spectacularly and most helpfully reliable uh, igniters of my imagination. And I know that as a writer, you're a fool if you don't go with your obsessions. If you ignore your obsessions and try and write what you think people want, you're an idiot. <laughs> you're going to fail. Forget it. Forget about it. You'll never you've be got successful. To do, you've got to be yourself. And I will even confess that I went through when I was in my uh, late teens and early 20s and the 60s, I went through a very conventional 60s, you know, phase and was briefly anti-gun, even though in my deepest heart, I knew I was faking it to be popular in the newsroom. Mm. And there came a moment, really, I, it's a bizarre moment. I went to see a movie and I got there early and I had time to kill and I went into a drugstore and in the drugstore was a magazine rack and in the magazine rack were some gun magazines. And the one I saw was, uh, it was the shooting times that announced the new Smith and Wesson 645. And I knew enough to know that it was a tectonic plate shift when Smith and Wesson went to build 45 automatics. So I bought that and I read every single word of that issue four times. And I suddenly was back. I was where I knew I had to be and where I wanted to be. And it was, it was like being reborn born again. It was mm. just this moment of, of uh, cosmic revelation. And I knew the path before me. And that's what kind of led to uh, my first published book. And that was an explicit oh. firearms book. That was The Master Sniper. Uh, and I remember I had written, I wanted to make sure that the two heroes carried M1A1 Thompson submachine guns. And when I got it back from the copy reader, she had crossed out, she'd crossed it out and she'd written something like big black thunder gun or something like that. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I went through the roof. Wrong and, genre. <laughs> you know, I just went nuts. See, in those days, that wasn't done. Nobody ever did that kind of stuff. Uh, Sometimes yeah. Hemingway would mention a firearm or Robert Rourke would mention a firearm, but nobody ever talked. I guess, I guess Mike Hamler carried a forty-five because he was a forty-five kind of guy. But there was none of that. There was none of. There was no lore. There was no culture. There was no real clear understanding of what they did and how they worked and how they felt and how they smelled. And that's what I wanted to get into those, in into the work that I had hoped I would do, and. Uh, that sort of discovery or that reaffirmation of the firearm personality in my psyche was really my breakthrough what, uh, as a writer. And I could not and would not have done it any other way. And I, it has led me to a fabulously interesting life. And I have no regrets whatsoever. I'll be one of the few men who dies without regrets. Uh, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have said that to that girl in 1950s. But other than that, <laughs> but other than that, I don't think that I, you know, I, I, I feel that I, I, I pursued my grail. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It was, awesome. a, some, it was yeah. some kind of almost religious mission, the, the, the uh, priesthood of, of Jeff Cooper. And I'm still in the raiments and I still, uh, I go to the services, which is the firing range every, uh, every, every day that I can. In fact, when I'm done with this endless interview, I will go <laughs> shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> well you, you mentioned uh, raymond chandler just a minute ago and i know you once said that you were fascinated by the hack genius and you mentioned chandler as somebody who is both an icon and a pulp fiction writer and i think you you referenced some other people maybe sam peckinpah uh, i wonder if you could explain that hack genius idea a little bit and 
do you think you've consciously or unconsciously tread that same ground with your career? Uh, I think I have consciously tread that same ground. I do respect another phrase I use for essentially the same phenomena is outlaw artist. And, uh, I, you know, I was aware from the very beginning that my, uh, my uh, awareness of and my love for and my enthusiasm for guns would in some way exile me from the polite society of, of writers who at that time, you know, uh, believe me, they're brilliant writers. I mean them no respect, but I just couldn't write too much about losing my virginity when I was 14 to my mother's sister. Didn't happen. Uh, would be a cool <laughs> book, but, 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 you know, that's what they wrote about. And I, I couldn't do that. Um, uh, and I always was drawn to people who stood outside the fence and did, um, uh, you know, did did things as if they, as if society didn't exist. And Peck and Paul would be one of those. And Mickey Spillane would be one of those. Uh, the 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 Chandler to some degree the the noir, the hard-boiled American writers of the 30s and 40s would, would be others. And they weren't currying, they weren't currying acceptance. They weren't sucking up to uh, the powers that were. They weren't desperate to get reviewed by the New York Times. I also thought that somehow being a radical in, not, not politically, but culturally, it also, it, it can work for you as opposed uh, to against you. Uh, pass it for me yet, but maybe it will. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, I mean, that's a, that, that's a reality of the business. And I also like the way they use the, the language. I also was very drawn to the language and I work hard. You know, it's just, I, I've always considered myself a much better writer than plotter and i there's lots of clunk in my plots lots of holy cow could that really happen kind of coincidences and uh, i wish i was a better plotter i had a jack have you got any spare plots i could use? <laughs> I, I need plot help brother believe me oh you don't that's why i, I, feel, that's why I, I like feel so much <laughs> i thought that was all intentional <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like, oh this is really inconventional well no it's because he couldn't think of anything else and it was four in the morning <laughs> don't yeah, confess anymore I, I love it i love it all <laughs> Well, um, Jack, you got a, you got another question handy, or are, you, are we ready to lightning? I'll ask a short one that's not too deep this time, so yeah. you can get get to the range. But uh, of course, one of the things that I have uh, have taken from you is uh, using weapons as characters and uh, and really developing them to tell a story about the person that uses them, not just what they're using, but how they're using it, how they carry it, all the things that I see when I look at somebody and I can tell uh, it tells a story exactly what the, how they carry that, what they're carrying it in, um, tells a story about that person. But uh, this, next, this next one, I reached out to the people from CZ to find out about if someone was to buy a Bruno, uh, though they pronounce it differently, in Africa in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, what would it be and yeah, what would the sites look like and all that sort of thing and wove it into the storyline of this third novel. So uh, my question is, uh, which one of the weapons that you have uh, really developed as uh, almost a character in one of your novels is your is your favorite was your favorite to research or is it just means means the most to you uh is it that thompson submachine gun or is it that uh 38 special or uh which 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 weapon is that uh i do in fact own a class 3 m1a1 uh i found that somehow shooting it was it, it just felt like I'm using, I'm drawing this metaphor from someone else, but it's like, it felt like standing in a shower and ripping up $50 bills, you know? It just, it just costs so much. I can't make myself shoot. I mean, suppose I, suppose I drop it for God's sake. It just scares me. You know, it sits in the rear of the safe, but that gun still speaks to me. Um, <clears throat> I... I'm also drawn to, I, I mean, I, the, I think the most beautiful gun ever made 
was the Winchester Pre-64 Model 70. And that is such a, it's just such a piece of, of, of fluidity of, 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 of art, if you will. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's symmetries, it's, it's constellation of lines. It's uh, just, I, 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 that's a gun I will look at over and over again. And every time I look at it, it refreshes me. And I have a few of them. Um, um, they just, they're just powerfully, they're just, you know, as you say, as, as I have said, and as I hope I've demonstrated, that's what to me is so interesting about uh, the firearm is they do develop personalities. You know, they have performance niches. It's so much fun to try and get the most out of one, to research it, to find out where it's from, who manufactured it, who designed it. And these are all stories. These are all great stories. And they're, to me, very, very, very interesting. And uh, I do so enjoy that, not only as a writer, but also as a shooter and a collector. Um, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm I, you know, I do change a lot. Right now, my obsession is uh, 38 special wad cutter semi-automatics. This would be the Model 52. Colt also made some national match 38 wad cutters. And uh, I own a couple of those. And but well, the magazines are very finicky. But if you get a magazine that works, it's a super accurate gun. And in a week, this I'm very pleased about, I'm picking up <clears throat> a Sig Hammerlight uh, five shot 38 wad cutter. Uh, it was supposedly designed in uh, response to the Model 52. It was Europe's attempt to crack that uh, bullseye market in the 50s or in, in the early 60s and uh, I obviously I haven't shot it yet I bought it from uh, you know I found it on the net and I, you know how that works sometimes you get a break in the auctions you know no one else has noticed it and you get a surprisingly good price and that's what happened here so I'm very excited about uh, shooting that pistol which I'll do uh, next week sometime and I'll come back and we can discuss that for oh five to seven hours <laughs> <laughs> we're up for it I, we are up for it I think well, you would have loved uh, I think you would have loved one of the coolest days um, when I was going through the secret service in the academy is they bring you to the the armorers collection and you get to walk through and touch all the weapons that the Secret Service has collected over the years. So you get to manhandle gently, not manhandle, <laughs> gently touch the like the Tommy guns and 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 uh, the three fifty sevens and some really really cool stuff. And it's something that hearing you talk, it's something you would you would walk in and they wouldn't be able to get you out of the damn. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I'll tell you the, my idea of heaven is <clears throat> Dan Shea's arms vault. He's the guy. Oh. Who runs? He used to be Machine Gun News. It's he's a he's a big class three guy in out in Vegas, and he's a he's a a friend of mine, a very decent guy. And when I was doing a book that involved the uh, German paratrooper rifle of mid to late war, it's FG forty two, I think it is. <clears throat> my mind is going, but he had three of them, and he <laughs> let me go out there and play with them. And, uh, you know, someplace on earth you can touch one of those things. I think they recently sold one in one of the big gun auction houses for 75000 bucks. Wow. Jack could afford it. I couldn't. <laughs> oh, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Well, Steve, you, you've uh, survived the precision shooting portion of the, uh, of the evening. Um, now, now this is the part where we just come in and spray the room with lead and, and hope to hit something. Um, we call it our lightning round. Um, we ask you three ridiculous questions a piece and um we didn't put a lot of thought into the questions so don't put a lot of thought in your answers um <laughs> but this is called the lightning round i'll start it off <clears throat> you can go back in time to 1993 and make a faithful adaption of point of impact in 1993 who plays swagger either tommy lee jones mm -hmm. because well, he's got the craigs in the accent uh i think maybe clint eastwood um he has got the craigs and I mean, he's, his voice is full of phlegm like mine is, so it doesn't matter about the accent. Uh, and I just, 
I don't know. Well, um, if, if we go off on talking about the movie that was made from point of impact, we'll be here another nine hours. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't need to know. That. No, no, no. I, always, I always wondered if, <laughs> if at that time you could have made it who, who you would have chosen. Um, my second question, how long would you have lasted in the box in Pale Horse Coming before you passed out from panic? Uh, 11 seconds. <laughs> now, I, I almost passed out reading. I'm well aware of the fact that I write about men who are far more courageous than I can be. <laughs> and I am sometimes shamed by that fact, but it's, I seem to be able to do it okay. And when I, someone like Jack tells me it's okay, he has no idea how good that makes me feel, so. Well, I, I will let you know, my, my palms actually were sweating when I read that passage in that book. I, 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 I had, to, had to regain my, my equilibrium after that scene. Well, I have to say, you know, as I say, you write to your strengths. And one of the things I believe I do quite well is ordeals. And I can, I can put you in the torture victim's hmm. shoes if I so choose. And that's been very helpful to me. And I, I do recall, I think I wrote, it's a fairly long passage, but I wrote it in one fever uh, uh, pitch. And, uh, don't think I ever changed it from the first time from, you know, there's no rewriting. That's just wow. what came out of my imagination. <clears throat> my last one's a pretty easy one. Um, and you don't have to say your very favorite, but a favorite, a favorite bourbon and a favorite cigar. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> I have to confess that the, the cigars are kind of a fraud. I don't, I'm not a big cigar. I, I don't smoke a cigar a week. And I don't uh, study cigarology. Uh, I have some friends, very good friend who owns a gun store in uh, Pennsylvania. I hang out with him a good deal. He's a cigar guy. He always brings me cigars. And uh, uh, whenever they, uh, uh, whatever, whatever he offers me, I smoke. And I don't, it's not adhesive information. In other words, gotcha. it doesn't <laughs> stick in my mind. Of bourbons, uh makers is 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 reliable uh i sometimes uh will uh uh there's a bourbon called russell uh, it's a boutique bourbon that's supposedly the best in the world and i had it a few times uh uh i i like expensive bourbon and cheap vodka that's the way I get through it. You know, vodka, I don't care. If it's another t shirt from uh, Mr. Hunter. It could be vodka, it could be gasoline. I don't care. I'll drink it. It buzzes me. That's all I ask. All right. Well, let me ask, let me ask you my three here. So the zombie apocalypse is upon us. What weapon from your safe, you can only choose one, which weapon from your safe do you grab? I would absolutely grab the, uh, or would I? <laughs> Forget I said absolutely. I would probably pick one of my M4s with optics. Uh, uh, I don't, I've got two or three. Um, I've got abundant ammo for the apocalypse. I've also <laughs> got a very nice arsenal. Uh, AK-74 and abundant ammo for the apocalypse. Uh, I hope to go down <laughs> with one in each hand and a real high body count. But we'll see. Maybe I'll surrender. And, uh, awesome. I'll probably surrender, but that's my hope. All right. so I would take a. I would take a modern, and I don't. I, I won't use the word assault rifle. Uh, I call the military facsimile semi-auto so i would take a modern uh uh military facsimile semi-auto with all the bells and whistles yeah. i really like the holographic yeah. sights those those are yep. great 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 fun particularly for a guy like me whose eyes uh are worthless at less than 10 inches and beyond 10 feet <laughs> only, <laughs> that's on the same boat yeah, the I, that's, same okay. boat. that's where I am. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What would Bob Lee Swagger complain most about you? What would he complain about me? Yes. What would your character, Bob Lee Swagger, well, complain no about truck you? truck with me. I mean, yeah. I, I, the book I'm working on, 
uh, you learn a lot about Bob and I, I'm not going to tell you the premise, but I guarantee you guys will love it. Okay. The, the, the three of you, the four of you will love it. No one else will get it, but you guys will love <laughs> it. doesn't it. matter. The pieces. Uh, we learn a lot more about Bob. And one of the reasons, one of the things he says is he comes under a lot of criticism for certain re things. And one of them is that he hangs out pretty much with other snipers. This is what I don't get about about. Uh, I'm sorry, I used the wrong name. About Jack, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for, uh, to be honest, he can mingle with us, uh, and he does so cheerfully and with. But I have Bob say, you know what? I prefer the company of other killers because I don't have to explain anything to them, and he would look at me and. You know, he would say, well, okay, he's a nice guy. He knows a lot about guns. He's kind of funny. His wife is beautiful. Um, <laughs> he's got bad hips like I do. Um, but he's not, he just, he hasn't been there, you know? And maybe he can fake it when he's sitting at the keyboard. And maybe, you know, I like to think that's of use, but that's still not the real thing. So that mm. would be his complaint about me. All right. Well, okay, here's a joke. This is one of the things I like to say. It turns out I was the movie critic of one of America's best newspapers for 11 years. You would think I could write a pretty good novel about being a movie critic. I couldn't write a novel about being a movie critic for love or money. I could write a pretty good novel about being a sniper. So my hope is that somewhere... There's a sniper who can write a really good book about being the movie critic of the world. Oh, you know, that's that. Jack's next book. I hope I'm begging him. Jack, I do it. This pen. This pen. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> oh. All right, my last question is this. You get locked inside the SHOT Show convention room and no one else is around and the, and, and the lights are about ready to go off and you think you can sneak out with one weapon that you saw there at the show. Which one do you grab knowing that you're gonna successfully uh, make your escape? Well, uh, you know what it would be? I'll tell you a gun I'm very interested in. I don't know if they'll adapt it or not, but it's SIG is in the running with three other firms for uh, the new Army uh, uh, oh, squad yeah. automatic weapon. Yep. Yep. And actually, it's not the SIG. I did get to handle that. Uh, I think it's the General Dynamics one. Uh, that's, I assume it was there. I didn't lay eyes on it. Uh, but they were probably had a booth and were showing it off. Because they're, they're all lobbying to get this huge contract. Yeah, that's a big um, one. And it's a bullpup. And it's got a kind of a bulbous suppressor on it. And all three of these guns fire a very interesting 277-ish calibers, you know, 6.8 millimeter yeah. calibers. And they look very, very interesting to me. And of the three of them, just visually and as for coolness factor, I thought the, the uh, general dynamics bullpup look the most interesting and if i could steal one of those and twenty thousand rounds and you could <laughs> drop me in some you know deserted junkyard with no human beings and i could shoot up cars and glass all i wanted that's my idea of heaven i think those rounds are like about three bucks a piece aren't they i'm there? sure they're incredibly expensive <laughs> They're charging the government. But wait till Mossberg comes out with uh, the version. Then they'll be short and cheaper. The government will just print more money. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So I'm going to ask three questions real quick. Speaking of cars, Stephen, when was the last time you got a parking ticket? Yo, geez. I've spent a fortune on parking tickets. <laughs> uh, really, it was only a couple of weeks ago. Oh, man. Uh, I, see, I live in a neighborhood without garages and with limited parking. and it depends on if the meter maids are feeling, <laughs> if, it, are they feeling nasty or benevolent? And no. sometimes they will nail you because 
one inch of bumper is extending into a no parking zone. And other times they'll let you park in the middle of the street for a week. <laughs> but I got one a week ago or maybe two weeks ago oh, because I was, I, I parked at something in a place again, where I'd seen millions of people park and I'd parked and not gotten tickets and I got a ticket. So yeah. there you go. All right. And so, um, if you were sleepwalking out of your, your house, where would you end up unconsciously? I mean, I'd travel. I mean, are we, are we restricting this to you walking out the front door? I can walk barefoot wherever you want. Yeah. yeah. I have very tender feet. So <laughs> I would end up on the front steps. <laughs> All right. Jack can walk to <laughs> Zimbabwe. We're still here in Indiana. I, I'm stuck at the front steps. <laughs> I'm walking to the bridge. It's a good spot to be. You turn right around, you're back home. You don't have to go walk too far. <laughs> and so my last question, put on your, uh, your uh, movie critique hat on and give me three words to describe the movie The Irishman. Uh, okay. Not seen it. Oh, and, and the reason is I love Scorsese and I'm looking forward to it, but I missed it in the big screen mm -hmm. and I don't want to watch it on the way I'm looking at you guys <laughs> on the little screen. And I'm hoping that it, when it comes to um, a pay-per-view, I can see it on a pretty big screen, my TV screen. Jack, you have any uh, lightning round questions for him? Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to do a lightning round one. My day was, uh, was hijacked by the, the Pratt announcement. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just, uh, ex express my, my deepest thanks and, uh, and just um, say that uh, I sincerely appreciate everything that uh, you've done for me both before uh, you knew me and, uh, and since we became friends uh, for inspiring me to, uh, to one, continue down this path. Um, and Jack, I read your, if I may interrupt, yeah. you have a little piece uh, it's that on your website, in your November choices, and you recall Point of Impact and how meaningful it was to you. And I was very moved, very moved by that. I, I have to tell you, uh, if you were here, bro, I'd give you a man hug. I, <laughs> I'm very, I was very pleased. And I, I just can't tell you. Very, very nice. See, he's a gentleman. He, there's no doubt about that. Absolutely. A sniper. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Kill you with yeah. kindness. We we often say when we're talking about Jack and how great his career is going, we always you know it's great to see good things happen to good people because he's been great. He was our first guest Very first. when we had no reason to have no you know no cloud at all. He uh, he agreed to come on the show and gave us a great launch. Um, still our most viewed episode, by the way. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we I we thoroughly um and sincerely appreciate you guys coming on. Both of you coming on tonight. Right. I I texted Jack the other day and asked him to step in for Eric and he was thrilled to do it. <laughs> I know you're both busy. And so we really appreciate it. And I just say at Thriller Fest, your line there was sleep late, drink early, drink early, drink early. shoot in between shoot in is between. still my favorite Loved it. quote of all time. Well, I hope that gets me in something. I don't know what, but I appreciate we, that. I'll tell you yeah. one thing, you need to merchandise that damn yeah, thing. Yeah, it needs That's to be a shirt. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I can tell you how to do that. <laughs> Well, listen, um, to our viewers, this came out in July. Game of Snipers. Is June one, in paperback. June. One of the mini, yeah, okay, out in one of the many uh, Stephen Hunter books that you need to buy. Um, Jack's book comes out here in April, right, Jack? Savage Son. Um, Stephen's next book, I think, is called uh, Big Black Thunder Gun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, very good. Keep, keep your eye out for that one. Wow. <laughs> hey, Jack, congratulations. I know we haven't spoken yes. yet, but congratulations on getting this out with uh, yeah. Chris Pratt. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing that project come to fruition because it, it's going to be phenomenal. It's our habit to toast our guests, so we want to toast you guys. And again, thanks for coming on the show. Thank uh, you, guys. Best luck. Thank you guys so much. And Jack, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate everything. I want to thank the great Stephen Hunter for coming on the show tonight and being so generous with his time. And I would also like to thank Jack Carr for being our special guest host. See you next time on the crew reviews. And remember, as Mr. Hunter says, sleep late, drink early, 
and shoot in between. Where's the live by? Whatever. <laughs> can, I, can I use profanity? Because Absolutely. It's, it's happened a time or two before. It's encouraged. It's, it's, it's a requirement sometimes. <laughs> and if you say, okay, Steve, do it all over again. I would, <laughs> I would just close the computer and we'll open see it. see Thriller Fest. <laughs> so this is a pre-64, model 94. Uh, my dad's old 3030 that I, I took out on a hunt here uh, in December. Yep. And it's, uh, <laughs> got my dad's bottle of vodka. Oh, yeah. That's all I can say. <laughs> as long as it's the cheap stuff, that's all we care yeah. about. <laughs> Hey, I guys, to... I want to A, go to yeah. the bathroom, and then B, go to the shooting range. All right, sir. In that order, <laughs> please. You guys. It was great fun. All right. We're going to do the outro for Stephen Hunter slash Jack Carr, and this is going to be round one. Here we go. <laughs> round one. <laughs> It better be vodka. No, that's the one you peed in. No. No, oh, that's disgusting. Come on. You done? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> sure. Go. Ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thanks tonight's guest, Stephen Hunter, for coming on the show and being so generous with his time. And we want to thank especially that above. Nope, nope. I, I do. Who are we danking? We danking? Danking. <laughs> Darius Lee. <clears throat> Must have been the jazz hands. It was. Out of the corner of my eye, I'm looking here, but I can see this up there. Ooh, hot. <laughs> Ooh, hot, <sighs> mic. hot mic. Hot mic. We want to thank the great Stephen no. Hunter for coming Whoa. up. Whoa. Whoa. You're still hot. Your, your mic Whoa. was like blazing hot oh, there. You. All right, now you're good again. Out. Okay. Take whatever. <laughs> <laughs> We'd also like to thank our special guest host, Jack Carr. Today, celebrating his... Why am I doing that? It's about <laughs> because it's gold. Okay. And Damn it. Five take Jake. Nice job. <laughs> there it is, boys. There it is. Well done.